Hanson, engage. You don't have to answer the question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Give us some men who know the truth! And who will declare the truth? And who will stand with Athanasius and Polycarp and Calvin and Luther and Whitfield and Edwards? And who will declare from the housetops that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? Well, I'm Caleb Harrelson. I lead Engage Apologetics. We are a ministry outside of El Paso, or based in El Paso, Texas. But we go anywhere where we're invited. And our, our great passion is to equip believers to know the total truth of Christianity and engage with others um, in answering objections and engaging conversations with them about the gospel. So today, we're going to talk about this issue of engaging with others about the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm so excited to get into this issue because um, I, I think there's, there can't be anything more important than the resurrection of Jesus. And they were proclaiming that and defending that. And, you know, a lot of times we, we just proclaim it, but we don't always explain why it's so significant. As believers, we should know amongst each other. And we should know why it's significant and why it matters and why it's true as we're, when we're talking with unbelievers as well. So... Let's look at this. Why should you care about being able to defend the resurrection? Well, the obvious is, one, it's a historical claim. We're not just making a, just a random spiritual claim that has no grounding in reality. It's grounded in historical truth is what we're saying. Second Peter 1.16, he says, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories. We were eyewitnesses. And so they're saying, you can test my claim. I'm not making this up. In summary, you could say that, that that's what they're grounding everything they're saying, the early disciples. And if Jesus did not rise from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, one of the great chapters on the resurrection, it says what about our faith? It's worthless if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And it comes down to that. It hinges on the resurrection, Christianity itself. And evangelism itself is engaging with people about the truth of the gospel or engaging with false ideas about reality and engaging them with this is the true description of reality the true description of history jesus is the focal point of all of history he was expected in prophecy all of history centers and revolves around jesus he is the preeminent one he is the head of the church and all of history is headed to a definitive point as jesus is determining in the end a point of history. And it centers around the claim that the resurrected Messiah has come and he will come again. So evangelism, we proclaim this. We engage with people about the truth of the gospel. And one of my favorite examples in scripture itself about evangelism, which is a word, it means the good news, sharing the good news. We're good newsing people, sharing this message is in Acts 26, the Apostle Paul himself. Let's look at how people, how Paul particularly, shared the gospel in the book of Acts. Now, I love this section. This is King Agrippa II. The first one died in Acts 12. Um, didn't, it failed to give glory to God. Now, Paul had been in a lot of trouble with the Jews for proclaiming the resurrected Messiah, Jesus. And so he comes to King Agrippa, and he's before Festus. And um, here's what he says here. We'll read it. But then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hands and began his defense. That word in the Greek is apologia. He began his defense, giving reasons for something. So apologetics is not something for these scholars in a lofty tower. It's something we all do. And we see a pattern that every believer in the New Testament was giving reasons why Jesus had truly risen from the dead and they weren't making it up. So he gives his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations 
of the Jews, and especially so because you are so you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known for me a long they have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer. And as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them, after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now I read that whole section because I want you to get a sense of how Paul was engaging with Festus and Agrippa. Now there's a couple things, hopefully you notice from there. One is, is a real obvious one. Paul was bold, right? Now boldness is a direct answer to prayer that we'd be faithful and obedient to, to speak the truth of God in, in the moment we need to, right? Now, remember he said, you believe the prophets, right? He's appealing to that common ground and he's speaking boldly in a section in a moment where he, he knew that the persecution is a, is a great um, reality in front of him. He also, he shared his testimony. He shared what he was before, and they had no motivation to be making this up. He was persecuting the church. 
and he was persecuting it zealously. He mentions that, which is a significant point for his motivation to change. Where would that motivation come from? We'll look at that more in a little bit. But he also pointed out, as I said, that he, had the, he didn't have the motivation to convert. And he appealed to other eyewitness testimony and the authority of the Old Testament. So he's appealing to these fulfilled prophecies, and we're going to look at those later, and the authority of God's already revealed word, and that standard he's appealing to of the fulfilled prophecies. And you notice what he said after he was insulted, which you may be insulted, or you may have been insulted. Oh, that's so ridiculous. It's so anti-intellectual to believe in that. So anti-science. But Paul said, no, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. He didn't say, well, I just feel it's true. No, he said, though, this is true. This is reasonable. It's as if Paul would say, faith in Christ is not a leap into the dark. It's a leap into the light. It's based off of good reasons and good evidence. So we're going to look at these reasons that the resurrection of Jesus is true. And we have these three key reasons with some subproofs, and I kind of combined two-ish and one. And you'll see why in a little bit. I think they go together very well. Number one, the empty tomb. Number two, early testimony and conversion of an enemy focused on Paul. And number three, expected testimony. So let's look at this first one here, the empty tomb. Now here is this claim that the tomb was empty. All Christianity is built off of that, that the tomb of Jesus was actually empty. And here's, here's one of the big issues we see is that, well, were, the, were Jews, if they were crucified or considered an enemy of the state, would they actually be buried in a tomb itself? And I, in fact, we see that from one skeptic um, that I've engaged with, friendly guy, but I obviously disagree with them. He's an atheist. And he said on his radio show, it was called Take on, uh, Take on Faith. He used to host it, doesn't anymore. A radio show on Las Cruces. He, um, he said, why would a Roman governor entomb this one specific criminal when normally you were executed, you were buried in a mass grave? Tombs are expensive. Tombs are limited. Those are safe for people of some status. No, he was just a guy claiming to be the Messiah. No, he's going in a mass grave. That's how it works. So he's saying we shouldn't even expect the Jew to be in a grave itself. They should have been just thrown in a mass grave, not a tomb. Um, now, that would have some weight, and hopefully you kind of feel the tension. We're like, okay, if that's true, then how can we claim that Jesus himself was in a tomb if everyone was just buried and piled up with the rest of the bodies? Well, there's a couple problems with that claim and objection. And, and one is that we have found evidence that some of the Jews that were crucified did have a proper burial, a proper Jewish burial. And sometimes the Romans did make exception for that case. And this was found in 1968. And uh, this ossuary, a bone a burial box, a four and a half inch nail connected with crucifixion that it says the Aramaic inscription there reads, Yohanahan, son of Hadkol. And it's showing that a Jewish person was crucified and that he had a proper burial. So we do have evidence, in the, at least in this case, we can say that someone was uh, properly buried, not just thrown in a pit. And hopefully you see that. That is significant. Also to the fact that many skeptics were claiming, well, we don't even know that crucifixion was around during the first century. Well, that put that to rest as well. Well, furthermore, we see the issue of <clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, part of the Sanhedrin. Why would the Christians make that part up? You see, that seems very odd if they would make that up. If Joseph of Arimathea um, did not have a part in him being, Jesus being buried in his tomb, that, that seems uh, of, of a big problem. And you see there on your notes, he was on the Jewish court that sin is Jesus. If this claim is false, why did Christianity grow? They could have immediately appealed to the common knowledge, appealed to Joseph of Arimathea. How could the Jewish authorities, who had tried so long to get rid of Jesus, not pay attention to his burial? Of course, they had Roman guards securing it as well. And we actually, we don't have competing burial traditions. Now we have, there's debate on is it the garden tomb or the holy sepulchral church? But the issue is burial traditions. Like, was he was he buried or was he not? Every, there was a, there's unanimous unanimous agreement that he was buried. In fact, and um, here's a good quote 
by New Testament scholar, Dr. Craig Evans. He says, I conclude that the burial of the body of Jesus in a known tomb, according to Jewish law and custom, is highly probable. I think it's also probable that the tomb in which family and friends knew the body of Jesus had been placed was known to be empty. I think it's also probable that the first to discover this tomb were women, among whom Mary Magdalene was the most prominent. These conclusions make the most sense of the evidence. It was the knowledge of the tomb and the discovery that it was empty, in addition to the appearance of Jesus, that led the followers of Jesus to speak in terms of resurrection and not in other terms. Now, this is so significant, this quote here, for a variety of reasons. Of One, we looked at the evidence of the nail and the, the ankle bone. We also have seen like Josephus and Philo of Alexandria, they have quotes talking about how the Romans allowed the Jews to have proper burials. But we also have, it was a known tomb. It was, the Jews were talking about, well, the body of Jesus was stolen. Well, that presupposes that the body isn't there. They're just trying to figure out how to deal with the facts, right? And that it was, I think we would have very good reasons to be, it was a known tomb. It wasn't like, well, we're not really sure where his body could have been. Like, why would we assume that the, that the Jewish leaders wouldn't go through the precautions exactly like we read about? Um, especially mentioning, as I said, Joseph of Arimathea, that you don't want to mention that if you're making up something. But also notice here that who are the first people to find the tomb? The women. Now, this is actually called an embarrassing testimony. Many historians will call this the criterion of embarrassment. Because if you're including something that may be embarrassing to your story, um, they say that's actually an indicator that you're telling the truth. And Dr. Frank Turek says in his book, Stealing from God, that people lie to make themselves look good, but nobody lies to make themselves look bad, right? Therefore, when authors claiming to write history include embarrassing details about themselves or their heroes, they're probably telling the truth. The New Testament documents are filled with embarrassing details that the writers wouldn't have invented. And to me, this is one of the easiest ones to remember because you think about the women finding the tomb first. Women's testimony wasn't considered valid in the first century. Why would you include that if you're trying to make it up? Now, there's a, a, a big list of embarrassing details in the New Testament documents in the Gospels of Jesus calling, um, telling Peter, get behind me, Satan, or Jesus' family not believing him. Um, you have many embarrassing details. The disciples seemed dim-witted uh, at first. They didn't quite get everything Jesus was saying. These are embarrassing details that I think are in there because they are true. And you wouldn't want to include that if you're really trying to spin the story to make it up. But they included it because they have a high regard for truth. And it's truly what happened. And so if there's one you could remember that's easy, I hope, I hope that this would be one that, that would stick with you. Um, the embarrassing detail that all points back to the empty tomb. So now we've looked at the empty tomb. Let's look at the second one, which I find so significant and very powerful as we look at this and zoom in here. Saul or Paul, um, he says, I was convinced that I had to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus. And what do you notice there? I have highlighted. He was trying to be against the believers of Christ. So he, he had this opposition, a very strong opposition. So think about it. Would Paul be motivated to convert? unless it was true. Like, think about what are the motivations that people may have to commit a crime? Cold case homicide detective Jay Warner Wallace says, there are three reasons that people are motivated to commit a crime. You have these in your notes as well, that it's money, sex, or power. He said he always sees one or more of these motivations on committing a crime. And he says, these are the same motivations for doing, committing sin as well. Now, did Paul have these motivations? No, he, he was a high-ranking leader in, the, in, in Jewish um, life. He was a Pharisee. He had power. And so you think of, you get beaten, tortured, and killed, kicked out of the synagogue, stoned to death. Uh, who's going to say, uh, sign me up, unless it's true, then it doesn't matter what the cost is. I'll do whatever it takes so the others may know Jesus. And that's exactly what happened. And praise God for that, because Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. And let's look at the timeline here on Paul. Now, Paul's writings were uh, all written before AD 70. And there's a lot of reasons we can, we can date it there. And most historians are in agreement that Paul probably died around AD 64. Um, 
Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus. We have Josephus, a Jewish historian, Hegesippus, another historian, around, uh, close to the time period, who would put James, the half-brother of Jesus, also died in the 60s as well. So we're going to say Paul died around AD 64. So we're going to notice here is that the closer we get to AD 33, the closer we get to the actual event, right? And that's really good because that's closer to the, the time frame and of eyewitnesses and um, before people may say before it could change. But I really think we can make a good case that most of the New Testament was written before AD 70, particularly because Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and which happened in AD 70, one of the most solid dates in history, AD 70, temple destroyed. And that would have been mentioned as, oh, it was fulfilled according to Jesus' prophecy. Um, I think you, there's a lot more you could say, but there's a good case that it was written before. For example, if I'm writing about September 11th, the two towers being destroyed by planes flying into them, and um, if I fail to mention 9-11 and I'm writing the history of New York City, you would think, well, one, he's a bad historian, or two, maybe he wrote in 1999. And I, I think in a similar way, we could say that's what we're seeing with a lot of the New Testament documents as well. Now, <clears throat> Paul, he didn't have the motivation to convert unless it was true. He didn't have a motivation to lie. But Paul's letters, we, some of his letters, even liberal scholars or skeptic scholars will say Paul's letters like Galatians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, they were written very early. And they won't dispute that Paul himself wrote them. And so it's significant that we point to Paul. We're not going to look at all the dating of the Gospels today because it takes a lot more time to go through. Um, but we're going to look at some a key areas we're going to highlight in Paul's timeline. And this timeline is also on my website. You could find this, and this will be up on my YouTube video. Now we see Paul born maybe between 9 or 12 AD, high priesthood of uh, <clears throat> Joseph, and Pilate becomes governor of Judea. Jesus' public ministry, and he's crucified 33 AD. Paul begins persecuting Christians, AD 34. Uh, Paul encounters the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, follows Christ, and then goes to Arabia. And then Paul goes to Damascus for three years. Paul also receives creedal traditions about Jesus. Now, this is significant as we're going to talk about intersecting historical artifacts that line up with Paul's timeline. And then we see Pilate removed as governor and Caiaphas removed as high priest. So Caiaphas was high priest before that, during the trial of Jesus. And Paul spends 15 days with Peter and James, Jesus' brother, and he receives creedal traditions. It's mentioned um, that he receives um, he, traditions from them um, about Jesus during his time on earth. And so if someone say, well, he wasn't the original apostles alive during Jesus' ministry on earth. But here's the thing. If Paul's writings are early, and were attributed to Paul, and they were early, and he's truly receiving oral traditions from the other disciples. We have every reason to trust what Paul wrote about Jesus's life and about the gospel. And we see Paul planning church in Corinth and, and also mentions the creedal or oral tradition. And we see him talking about that in 1 Corinthians. And we see Gallio mentioned in AD 52. And then Paul writes his earliest letters, Galatians, Romans, and 1 and 2 Corinthians, um, early 50s, around that time period. And then Nero uh, Paul is executed around 63 or 64. So I'll highlight these areas right here. The crucifixion, Paul comes, follows Christ, and then he interacts with Peter and James, and then what's going on in Corinth and his writing of those letters. Now, this is so significant because we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15 itself. We believe, many scholars believe, that it has one of the earliest oral traditions in the New Testament. Now let's look at this. And while Paul prefaces it, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you would have believed in vain. So here he's going to quote something that he received early on from Peter and James and the other apostles, an oral tradition, a creed, a summary of Christian faith. And many scholars believe what we're going to read right here. It, it dates all the way back to maybe within the year or years of the resurrection itself, around AD 33. And this is one among maybe 41 oral traditions that Dr. Gary Habermas has found in the New Testament. And one of the reasons you can find the indicator it's an oral tradition is 
You see on there, I received, I passed on to you of first importance. It has the wording that sounds like an oral tradition. And he says this, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So there are several things we notice in here that's really exciting. It is, of course, that it is an early tradition within years of the resurrection itself. We also notice that he's using Peter's Aramaic name, Cephas, which is another indicator that it was probably early. But what else do we notice here is that he says he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Now, that's significant because some people would say maybe it was a hallucination. But there aren't group hallucinations is not a thing. Uh, many psychologists will say that's not how it works. People don't all have the same hallucination at once. But that also is presupposing that these people, as he said, are still alive. You could talk to them. And then he mentions names of people. That's also putting these people on the crosses. We'll go talk to them. So this is a publicly testable religion. Unlike all other religions, particularly, I think of um, Islam, you have one guy who claimed to have a vision. Now, I think they may have had a vision. I don't think it was from the Lord itself. It may have been a spiritual demonic encounter that Muhammad had in a cave or Joseph Smith had in a claim in, a, in the woods in, um, in the 1800s. But it wasn't testable and that, that it was, was it truly with the Lord? And did other people see it? There's the big difference. Christianity is a publicly testable and claim, historical claim that we're making right here. 500 eyewitnesses. It's all around. It isn't like, well, we think it happened. Someone said it happened. They had a motivation. It doesn't really make sense with the data. You have to deal with the historical data of what's going on in the time period. Then what's the likelihood that this would be made up in a Jewish context. That Jesus is God and truly God and truly man. It's very unlikely to be made up unless it's true. And then he says, then he appeared to James and then he mentions himself. And so we can take a lot of stock in what Paul is saying in Paul's writings himself um, right here. And this is a very significant um, eyewitness testimony here. Now, as I showed you on the timeline, we're in the time period of the eyewitnesses. But we also have some other archaeological artifacts that have some good crosshairs and complement the timeline of Paul and the timeline of the Gospels. Now, Caiaphas, we found a, a bone box, an ossuary bone box in 1990, and it was dated around the time period when he should have been in position and power of uh, bones of an 80-year-old man. And it mentions there um, Caiaphas, his name. I think it's actually on the side there uh, on this picture. And <clears throat> we have uh, Pilate. Uh, Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea, also dated in the first century and is this inscription written in Latin in Caesarea Maritima. Um, it was discovered in 1961. How is it also pinpointing him in the first century? And you think about it, if they had him at another time period when they were dating when he was in his position of authority, that would be a problem, right? But alas, it is confirmed what we see in scripture. Now, another part of, that is significant of the dating of Paul's timeline and the writing of Paul is the Gallio inscription. It confirms the timeline of Paul. And you can look this up, the Gallio inscription, and um, you will find these same details on there. It is found in Delphi, Greece, in 1908. A proclamation in, issued by Emperor Claudius. It mentions a Roman governor, Gallio, and it, and it helps us pinpoint that right around 80, 51, or 52, that's when he was interacting with Paul. So that helps us figure out the dating of things like 1 Corinthians as well. It's, it's very exciting um, finding these things, and you can look them up some more. Now, why do I mention these guys here? You may be like, oh, what are all these names? Now we see Paul, Peter, and John, some key prominent leaders, some prominent apostles. They also discipled people who discipled others. So Paul discipled Clement, Peter, Ignatius, John, Polycarp, and so on. Now what do you see here in these black lines is, direct association. The red is uh, some association. Now, what do I mention these guys? Not just to throw out names. These guys like Ignatius and, and so on were also, can also be called church fathers 
meaning they were part of the early church. Now, these guys, there was some overlap with Polycarp and John, um, that Polycarp, obviously being younger, he knew John, and he heard directly from the eyewitnesses, and he wrote about um, the apostles, and he wrote about Jesus as the resurrected Messiah, and you see many of uh, writings in Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, talking about them, and so, uh, and from each generation, um, obviously, Irenaeus uh, came much later, 150, okay, so there wasn't a, the same type of overlap, but the claim we're dealing with is well, could the Gospels have been corrupted after all the apostles died? I know many cults make those claims, but it's actually impossible because of the overlap of the, the, the next generation of the disciples' disciples. And that's the real, the key thing I want you to understand. There's more that could be said, but total loss, loss or corruption of the original message is impossible. We have many quotes from early church fathers that um, we can reconstruct a lot of the New Testament, not all of it, but a large chunk of it from the early church fathers. And so there's good overlap, but I think this whole time period right here is the age of eyewitnesses and particularly Paul, we can look at, well, we have his writings that are dated early and he shows he was an eyewitness. So we have the empty tomb, good reasons to believe there's an empty tomb. We have early testimony and conversion of an enemy. And this last one, we're gonna highlight some key reasons why the expected testimony, fulfilled prophecy, can give us great confidence that Jesus is truly who he claimed to be as the resurrected Messiah and who the apostles claimed he is. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think everyone should have a working knowledge of the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. At that time, before the discovery, I think it's actually around 1946, the first initial discovery, <clears throat> the oldest manuscript of the Old Testament that we had was called the Masoretic Text around 9th or 10th century and uh, like 900s or so um, AD. But And so there's a lot of claims of, well, that's so much later than when the Old Testament events happened. And um, How do we know they haven't been changed? How do we know it's been preserved? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls pushed that back almost a thousand years before um, that time period, around 200 B.C., and this discovery in the 40s was this little shepherd boy named Muhammad walking around with his sheep and he threw a rock and one fell into a cave and broke a jar. And lo and behold, that led to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and many other discoveries and uh, several other caves. And some of them date from 250 BC all the way to around 70 AD. Now, the particular uh, area we're going to highlight on is around the northwestern part of the Dead Sea is Qumran, also known as the Qumran Caves. There's so much written about these, but we're just going to hit on the important things that you need to know. So these come around caves, here's another picture of them, is where we found were called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they contain portions of every book of the Old Testament, with the exception of Esther, and 1,300 manuscripts from the Dead Sea area. So a massive uh, trove, <laughs> massive pile of this, the manuscripts, and these dating um, before Jesus, particularly um, Isaiah, um, Job, Psalms. And so here's a, a copy of the Psalm scroll. And um, yeah, so dated between 200 BC or some maybe 250, depending on which one you're reading. But we definitely have confirmation they were before Jesus and a thousand years older than any other manuscript. So the Masoretic test, text, then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were nearly identical. And what does that tell us? That they were preserved really well. The, the Old Testament manuscripts were preserved well, so got rid of that objection. But it also showed us that the disciples weren't making up these prophecies. Some claimed, oh, these prophecies like Isaiah 53, it's so good. I think Christians wrote those later and then to try to make it look like Jesus fulfilled prophecies. Well, actually shows us they were written. Now, they were written before 200 BC. Isaiah was in the 7th century BC. Of the original but that was the this is the oldest manuscript um, of the entire book of isaiah we have smaller fragments of the old testament um but this is um the largest we have uh in the, the largest and oldest um, com complete except for esther we have the great isaiah scroll is so significant here's a zoom in there <clears throat> because it, it pinpoints this bullseye we're going to end with isaiah 53 and here's some bullseye of some fulfilled prophecies genesis 3 seed of a woman jeremiah line of david micah from bethlehem isaiah 9 
both God and man, visits the temple, which would have to be before AD 70, right? Because the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So that really narrows down when Jesus would have had to come. And then Daniel 9 uh, dies 33 AD and is a sacrifice for the people. And it talks about the type of death Jesus had, the type of trial Jesus had, and that he would rise from the dead, Isaiah 53. It's a beautiful section. If I have five minutes to share with someone uh, the gospel or how I know Jesus is the resurrected Messiah, I'll most likely turn to Isaiah 53 because it's an excellent section. Now you think about Isaiah 53, we have this evidence is written before. There's, there's no way we can get around. You have to deal with these fulfilled prophecies, this expected testimony. And now here's a point one of my friends made. He wrote a book um, on a why to trust the Bible. And he talks about how even Jesus' own enemies, they fulfill prophecy. And you think about that. Couldn't they have kind of been like, wait, don't, let's change this up so they won't claim that it was fulfilled. Yet it still happened. And we look at um, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. Uh, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Now, if this was a prophecy and referred to in Zechariah, then you would think that the Jewish leaders would have been like, let's change that number. <laughs> yeah, this is not what happened. And we see that mentioned again in Matthew 27, the 30 pieces of silver. My friend Charlie, on his 10 Reasons to Believe the Bible book, he makes this point. That says, what would it take to break this prophecy? Betray him for 20 pieces of silver, 40 pieces of gold. Don't buy the fill. Jesus' own enemies, while he was on trial and then dying, fulfilled some of these prophecies. God is so high above and beyond any plotting of man and the devil himself that he can direct his very enemies to carrying out his will. Amen? Paul even states that if the enemies of Christ knew what they were doing, they never would have crucified Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.8. And I love this point because you think about it can only be an act of God that could bring about the enemies fulfilling out, <laughs> fulfilling prophecy. And, and so expected testimony is so significant. And we have material data before Jesus. So in summer, we have the empty tomb, the early testimony and conversion of an enemy. And number three, expected testimony.